I welcome you to the module 10 of uh, this course and this is the last lecture of module 10 and we are discussing about emotional intelligence part 1 in this module and uh, today's lecture number is overall 25 number lecture and uh, this is the third lecture of module 10. So, in today's lecture we will be talking about another skills of emotional intelligence that is self regulation or self management. So, we are discussing uh, skill one by one. So, in the last lecture we talked about self awareness today we will be talking about self regulation or self management. So, just to give you a brief recap of what we have discussed in the last lecture we have discussed about the concept of self awareness in the last lecture and we try to understand the concept of self awareness and the different types of self awareness uh, such as internal self awareness and ex external self awareness. We also discussed various component of self awareness in terms of e emotional awareness, uh, you know self confidence and also a kind of you know uh, assessment accurate assessment of oneself. We have also discussed blind spots in awareness where we generally the research shown that um, uh, very few people are actually in a true sense self aware. So, there are many blind spots which kind of hinders self awareness. Uh, factors including lot of experiences in terms of particularly in the type of workplace and higher position actually can block self awareness. We have discussed the different reasons for it and at the end we have discussed uh, how to increase self awareness particularly through proper feedback system and introspection. And in the context of introspection also we have discussed that you know uh, introspection may not always lead to higher self awareness. So, there are certain kind of intricacies to it in terms of how what kind of question we ask also determines the success of self awareness. So, these are the some of the things that we have discussed in the last class. So, today we will be talking about the concept of self regulation or self management. In that context we will be discussing few concepts related to self regulation uh, like delayed gratification, uh, self distancing and so on. So, we will be talking about some of these things. So, the concept of self regulation or self management uh, some of the uh, in, uh, you know, introductory aspects we have already discussed in another lecture. In this lecture we will be mostly discussing in the context of emotional intelligence. So, that was a more a general discussion in the earlier uh, lecture. Uh, today's lecture will be more in the context of emotion regulation and, uh, uh, and emotional intelligence. So, uh, the concept of uh, self regulation or self management is is one of the most important component of almost all theories of emotional intelligence. So, we cannot you know one of the most uh, important thing that comes to our mind when we talk about emotional intelligence is self regulation. How are you able to kind of regulate yourself control your expression of emotion according to the context. So, this is one of the most important uh, aspects of emotional intelligence that is most visible. So, today we will be talking about uh, some of the different aspects to it, uh, so that we understand this concept more detail. So, self management involves using our understanding, uh, using our understanding of our emotions to control and direct ourselves. So, it is more about you know, controlling your expression, experience of emotion and it is based on your understanding also. The essence of self management is to regulate our emotions, so that they do not govern us. People who are not able to regulate emotions, emotions kinds of regulate them, you know. So, whatever emotion they experience, their life kind of flows in this in the in those directions. So, kind of emotion regulates them rather than they regulating emotions. So, emotion regulation is very important in that context that you take charge of emotions and use it the way it is productive or it is necessary in a particular context. To achieve this we need to use our knowledge of our emotions to govern our behavior. Knowledge of emotion is very important, understanding is very important which also includes employing methods that assist us in regulating our emotions. So, different strategies some of the strategies we have already discussed few more we will be discussing in today's lecture. Identifying and preventing emotional triggers what triggers sometimes you know unconscious expression of emotions. So, identifying those are also very important and avoiding thought patterns that may lead to emotional break, breakdowns. So, controlling of the thought is also very important. So, it is very crucial to manage our emotion because the alternative is very unappealing. So, if you are not able to regulate emotions or manage emotions, uh, the, your quality of life will suffer to a large extent because people generally do not I know generally there will be kind of in terms of your social life, in terms of your relationship everything may get spoiled because of lack of emotion regulation. So, it has a lot of applied implication in terms of quality of our life. 
So, people who do not manage their emotions in the business world are frequently referred as rageaholics or drama queens. They elicit uh, the kind of elicit size, eye rolls and even terror from others. So, people who are kind of all the time busting out emotions and not able to regulate that. Generally, people do not like to be associated with them. They kind of frequently people use and kind of avoid them because you know no one wants to be associated with people who are not able to regulate their emotions you know. So, it is very self evident that if you cannot control yourself you cannot manage others. So, this is something very important. So, if you yourself are not able to regulate your own emotions um, you cannot expect expected to control others emotions or kind of manage the emotions of other people. So, no one wants to follow someone who lacks control self control. Uh, the traditional idea that a boss or a leader is valued because they employ whatever method necessary to obtain uh, results from their team is a thing of past. So, that is not some, some, somehow does not work in the present scenario that a leader or a boss who use any tactics just to bring out the result uh, because that does not work in today's scenario and it generally do not work in the relationship context because you may be harming or kind of impacting negatively people in their lives and their relationships and even despite that if you get result also the problem is a lot of other complications will happen. So, that is not something that is desirable. So, self control, self management, self regulation is something very important and it is also very important for the leaders and people who kind of influence other. If they themselves are not able to regulate their own emotions, people will not like to follow and kind of the respect they required will not they, they will they will not get those kind of respects and um, satisfaction from connection with those people. So, one important thing is the self awareness precedes self management. So, self awareness is very important we have already discussed in detail what is self awareness in the last lecture. Without self awareness you cannot also regulate self or manage yourself because first thing is that you need to understand become aware that what what are the patterns you have what triggers your emotions. Uh, how you kind of uh, you know, deal with other people all this understanding and awareness is very important. With that awareness obviously, slowly slowly one can regulate management, but without awareness it is not possible. So, that is the requirement kind of a preceding requirement for self management or self regulation self awareness is very important. It is a kind of prerequisite uh, for self management and self control without knowledge of our emotions it cannot uh, be challenge challenging it will be very challenging to manage them effectively because a lot of this uh, kind of lack of self regulation happens because you are not aware. So, a lot of this unconscious pattern uh, you know kind of plays out in the world in, in the behavior of people because they are not aware how they are behaving and reacting. So, whatever pattern happens they just keep expressing and they just flow with that. So, that can create problem because of and a lot of this actually arises because of lack of self awareness. So, self awareness can be particularly helpful in managing negative emotions particularly like anger and all the kinds of destructive emotions uh, to manage them self awareness is very important. By identifying and understanding our negative feelings, so we can often diminish, diminish or regulate the impact. So, self awareness is something very important and we have already understood the details of it in the last lecture. So, this is an example that is all, uh, also just to uh, add on to understanding of that that how self awareness can be important. So, for example, you know uh, <coughs> If someone experiences fear before meeting an important client, one can often elevate or uh, reduce those anxiety by acknowledging the emotions and its cause. So, if somebody is afraid of some kind of upcoming event, so one thing you will understand that no, that is this particular event is causing that particular emotions like anxiety and so on or fear. So, one, one needs to acknowledge that this is what is happening. Once I recognize that I am afraid or there is a sense of anxiety, I can take steps. So, first if you can recognize that become aware that okay, I am experiencing this emotion because of this upcoming event. So, there is a kind of uh, mental expectation for something about that event. So, that awareness that recognition is very important. So, if you recognize you can do something about it if you even and if you do not understand and aware of this impact of this particular event then there is no possibility. So, that awareness and recognition is very important then one can take some step to address it. Now, I know that feeling scared before an important event is common for me. So, this this may be a general pattern of one's emotional expression. 
So therefore, when I sense fear, it reminds myself that means that meeting is significant. So when you fear anxiety and uh, in the context of particular meeting or something, it reflects that it is a very significant meeting. So you understand the signal of it in terms of emotions, how emotion is, what is emotion is signaling you. This acknowledgement is usually sufficient to come and remind that my fear is serving a purpose. So then you accept the fear that is an, it's a pattern and it is kind of indicating that it is an important event. So I am apprehensive about it uh, and once you acknowledge that kind of accept that then obviously it will not the intensity will go down uh, and it will you will understand that it is serving a purpose. So it will it can become a productive in that sense. So this self awareness that understanding can enhance your self regulation. So this is a, just an example of that. Now few terms that are used kind of interchangeably uh, but they may be kind of little technical differences in terms of this uh, understanding or defining this term. One is delayed gratification, another is self control and self regulations. These concepts are generally kind of uh, interchangeably used and inconsistently used in the literature. So, let us see what are the differences in, uh, in terms of meaning of these terms. So, delayed gratification basically refers to one's ability to resist an impulse for an immediate reward to receive more favorable reward at the later time. So, it is a kind of ability to resist an immediate reward you know. So, many times we get something and we want to get it immediately, but one's ability to resist this reward and why you should resist because if you resist and wait for some time you may get a better reward or a larger reward. So, resisting immediate thing can give much better result. So, that is why uh, the ability to resist particularly to get a resist an immediate reward to get more favorable reward at a later time or more you know kind of a larger reward at a later time. So, that ability is called as delayed gratification. So, are you able to delay the impulse of gratifying immediately? Because if you stop yourself then you can get a better reward. So, that ability is called delayed gratification. So, this is kind of a standard definition that has supported uh, by research that highly successful individuals possess the ability to delay gratification. A lot of research shows that delayed gratification is very important for success in life because then you can kind of control yourself and uh, rather than going with whatever is immediately available and control yourself so that you know you get a better outcome later. So, that ability is very important for success in life and various endeavors of one's life. A lot of research has actually shows, shown that. So, that is called delayed gratification. So, so, there is an element of self control, self management here that you control yourself whatever is immediately very enticing uh, because that self control or controlling yourself immediately can lead to much better result later. So, this is a term that is connected to self regulation. And the term self regulation is a is a kind of very broad concept that encompasses the concept of self control you know. So, so self regulation is a very broad term, self control is kind of one aspect of it and kind of uh, this delayed gratification is a specific aspect a specific case of self control. So, self control is just another const construct that exists on the continuum of self regulatory abilities. So, self control is one of the particular category of self regulation, which also includes impulse control, ego resiliency and so many things. Delayed gratification is positions between these two construct on the continuum. So, in summary delayed gratification is a basically specific case of self control, which is component of a self regulation. So, you have self regulation. which is the broadest term under this basically can come many self regulation things. One of the self regulation could be kind of self control and one specific example of self control is delayed gratification. So, delayed gratification is a specific case of self control which comes under self regulation. So, self regulation is the broadest term which includes many self regulatory abilities including self control and delayed gratification is one particular x case of 
self control because you need to control yourself for the immediate reward so that you get a better reward later. So, that the delay of gratification is as we, as we have already discussed is an ability to postpone an immediate reward. Why you need to postpone? Because if you postpone it, you will get a better reward in later time or in the future for the sake of more valuable reward in the future. It is a crucial aspect of self-regulation and exercising self-control. So, here very self-control is kind of inbuilt in it. You need to control yourself for whatever is reward is there immediately uh, to get a better reward in the future. So, in most cause cases delayed gratification is evaluated through tasks that ask people to give up a smaller immediate reward in order to receive a larger reward later. So, in the experimental setting this is mostly done where uh, people are asked to give up a small reward if they wait for some time they will get a more better reward later. So, mostly the tasks are designed like that so that and then see whether people are able to wait for some time or not and that is how it is measured in the experimental setting. So, the capacity for a delayed gratification tends to increase as individual grow older. So, this ability naturally increases H, a small child will find it very difficult to delay gratification if some enticing things are given to the child maybe chocolate or something the child would want it immediately. So, delay of gratification will be obviously difficult for a child, but as the child grows as people become older this ability may increase because then you can kind of uh, intervene with other thought processes. By the age of 4 children begin to develop slowly slowly age of 4 they slowly can begin to develop uh, some future oriented thinking. So, some delay of gratification may kind of they can do at the age of 4. By the age of 5 they kind of uh, exhibit cognitive strategies necessary for delaying gratification. So, somewhere at the age of 4 5 they can do delay of gratification uh, because of little bit of cognitive complexity kind of develops to understand the future aspects. However, there are notable difference among individuals not all children will be equal in delay gratification like all adults will also be not same people will differ in terms of delay of gratification. So, in some of the research shows about 30 percent of 5 year old children prefer not to delay. So, in some of the experience shows about 30 percent of children who are in the age of 5 you know uh, they did not delay they immediately uh, kind of got whatever reward was there without delaying and getting a better uh, reward. So, but some children could delay. So, there are individual differences why these individual differences it could be because of the differences in cognitive skills related to delay such as executive function. So, uh, some uh, people may differ in terms of executive functioning you know to delay a gratification you need some cognitive ability in terms of executive functions in terms of you know uh, thought processes that you want to delay it and uh, kind of some futuristic thinking is involved. So, that cognitive ability may differ from individual to individual and those who could think like that probably they could um, uh, delay be, you know uh, delay more than other uh, children. So, variation in the brain morphology could also be another reason an activation of regions like prefrontal cortex that support these abilities. So, some brain regions kind of support this comp complex cognitive processes like prefrontal cortex. So, that could also differ in terms of activation of some people. So, if that is more active probably they could delay more as compared to other individuals. So, so that brain morphology cognitive abilities these differences could explain why individual differs particularly the children in terms of a delay of gratification. So, one of the most famous experiment that uh, kind of was done in the context of delay of gratification is marshmallow test uh, it was done on children. Uh, so, this uh, was done to examine the factors that contribute to delay of gratification psychologist Walter Mischel is one of the first person who did research on delay of gratification he and his uh, colleagues uh, devised experiments experimental scenarios known as marshmallow test in 1960s and early 70s. Uh, so, they use variation of these experiments to kind of understand delay of gratification particularly among children. So, this test involved presenting children with choice between a larger reward such as two cookies or marshmallows and a smaller reward such as one cookie or marshmallow. So, 
two choices were given. One is small reward like one marshmallow or one cookie and uh, a larger reward with two cookies and two marshmallows uh, that they need to choose and how they need to choose the children were informed that if they waited for the experimenter to return they could receive the larger reward but if they signal the experimenter they could receive the smaller reward immediately so the smaller reward one cookie or one marshmallow they could take and have it immediately if they want but if they wait for some time the experimenter to return maybe after 10 or whatever certain time period if they wait for that time they will get two cookies and two marshmallows so that is how the children were asked to uh, see whether they are able to delay their gratification or not so thus obtaining larger reward required resisting the temptations so for a child in front of them if marshmallow is there obviously it will be difficult for them to resist so to what extent they could resist because if they want two marshmallow they need to wait for some time so to what extent the children uh, could wait so that kind of showed their delay of gratification so this marshmallow test has been highly beneficial in demonstrating the importance of delay of gratification and identifying strategies that enable children to delay it so obviously in that experiment uh, some children could delay some did not delay and so on so notably uh, the children who exhibited better self control were able to wait longer during the test at the age of 4 displayed higher level of social and academic success in the later years so generally it was shown the children who uh, could delay their gratifications who could wait who are able to wait for longer period in their those kind of experiment they kind of kind of longitudinally this also kind of found out how these children are doing later in their life uh, they also found they actually displayed uh, also uh, even at that time also they kind of uh, had kind of uh, displayed higher levels of social and academic success in later life so it predicted some indicators of success in the later life when they could delay their gratification at the age of 4 including higher scores on sat uh, during high school so probably this so they kind of uh, it indicates that delay of gratification could be very important in terms of focusing on particular goal and reaching that goal this marshmallow test was also adapted for adolescents for higher little bit of uh, higher age uh, uh, boys and girls and uh, teenagers and it was adopted by psychologists like you know some of the experiments were done by Wolfert and her colleagues this also adaptation also revealed that middle and high school student who demonstrated the ability to delay gratification for monetary reward waiting for a week so the waiting period was more in this case they had to wait for a week to get a better monetary reward so those who showed this delay of gratification they achieved higher grades exhibited fewer behavioral issues in schools and were less likely to engage in the use of cigarettes alcohol and other drugs compared to the peers who does not delay the gratification who chose not to delay the gratification so again here for the adolescents and teenage teenagers also it shows that you know delay of gratification those who could delay gratification they were kind of uh, had a better kind of you know scores in other parameters including you know academic uh, performance in terms of grades and they also had less behavioral problems uh, including like you know uh, smoking cigarettes taking alcohol and drugs and so on as compared to the peers who chose not to delay gratification so in terms of many positive outcomes delay of gratification has always predicted many positive outcomes in life because it indicates the sense of self control and self regulation so why this happens why there are individual differences so the uh, researchers found that there are two systems in terms of how we decide something uh, some aspects of it we have already also discussed one is called hot and cool system kind of how what is the mechanisms of this uh, delay of gratification so th through manipulating different aspects of the situation uh, researchers have gained insight into the factors that contribute to the waiting in children so what factors contribute to delay and gratification why some children could delay and why some other could not how to explain that differences apart from just uh, brain and other factors so uh, matt Clef and michelle in 1999 suggested there are two thinking processes involved in delay of gratification one is called as hot and another is called cool system 
So, in the thinking processes, these two system uh, determines the different as different outcomes and can explain delay of gratification. So, the cool system is designed for complex thinking, understanding time and remembering specific events. This system is referred to as no system. So, basically, whenever you use cool system in your thought processes, you are basically thinking complexly and trying to understand different aspects of a system and you are also trying to understand and remember specific events and basically you are trying to know and understand and using complex processes, thinking processes. On the other hand, hot system when one is employing is specialized, especially when we are doing quick processing of emotions and reacting based on certain triggers. So, hot system is very quick and it is mostly when we react based on our emotions and some triggers, not much thinking involved in it, whether they are uh, unconditional or conditional. This system referred to as the go system. So, something triggers and you just go. And so, that is the hot system of thinking. So, these are the characteristics according to the Metcalf and Michel uh, from their research. They showed that there are the, the, this is how they are different. In the hot system is very emotional. It is just go, triggers and you go. It is more simpler processing. It is more reflexive. It is fast. It generally develops early in the childhood. Mostly in the children, hot system is there. They, they cannot do complex processing. So, generally it is accentuated by stress. So, under stress, our host system become more active. So, when we are very stressed, hot system will become more prevalent. On the other hand, cool system is more cognitive, more thinking is involved in it. It is about no system. You do not just go by the trigger, you try to understand the things. It is much more complex. It is reflective. It is not uh, reflexive. Reflex means something happens and you just follow the reflex. In reflection, you think about it. This is much more slow and generally develops later. It is generally cool system decreases under stress. So, people generally do not use cool system under stress. So, it, it, is mo it is associated with more self control and here it is more stimulus control, whatever is there that will control you. In the cool system, you will con you are more likely to control yourself and uh, judge the situation and then act accordingly. So, these are two systems of thinking processes involved in it. One is fast, one is very, one is slow, one is com complex, one is more simple. So, in the context of delay of gratification, waiting becomes more challenging when children focus on emotional or hot aspect of the reward. So, whenever they use this hot system, emotional triggers, then delay of gratification becomes much more difficult and it becomes easier when one uses cool aspect of the situation. Okay. So, every situation if you just focus on the emotional aspect of it, you are using hot system and if you are using more uh, intellectual aspects and more thinking processes of a particular situation, then it is cool aspects of the situation. For instance, children who are encouraged to think of marshmallow reward as fluffy clouds are more successful in waiting. So, you, you are kind of thinking marshmallow in some other aspects like it is like a fluffy clouds and so on. So, some intellectual aspects are there. So, you are not uh, focusing on just emotional aspects, but more other intellectual aspect of the situation. So, if a child thinks of, of marshmallow as a fluffy cloud, they are more successful at waiting compared to uh, those who prompted to think about sweetness and texture of marshmallow. The taste of it, it is more emotional. Taste will trigger emotions and hot system. Then it is difficult to wait. So, delay of gratification is generally associated with cool system. So, the more you are able to use this cool system, the more uh, delay of gratification is possible. Hot system is generally uh, whenever we are using uh, we, delay of gratification becomes more difficult. So, children who excel at delaying gratification have learned strategies to divert their attention from enticing aspect of the immediate reward. So, if you, if you are not focusing on the just enticing aspect of the immediate reward, then you can delay it. But if you are thinking only about the enticing aspect, then hot system will come into the play and it will be difficult to delay the gratification. For example, a child with strong delay abilities might distract themselves by singing a cheerful song and observing their surroundings, basically focusing on something else while waiting. Conversely, a child with weak delay abilities might fixate on the cookies and its enticing taste. 
they will focus on only the taste part and you know, then it is bit difficult to wait. Over time, children improve their cooling strategies. Obviously, we can use more of cooling strategies as we age and most adolescents can easily endure 10 minutes wait time that would be challenging for a preschooler. So, obviously, with the passage of time or with the progress of our age, cool system, we can use it much better way. Unfortunately, accessing cool system or ability to delay becomes more difficult sometimes when it is actually required very strongly, uh, especially when we are stressed, then it can actually negatively impact our cool system and hot system becomes much more active. So, sometimes under difficult situation, stressful situation, cool system may be actually very important, but at that time it is big, it becomes most difficult even for adults. So, stress negatively affects the capacity to delay gratification. For example, during the first semester of a college when it would be highly beneficial to control urges to overindulge in drinking and eating, such urges are frequently succumbed to. When it is very important, especially in the first semester and college when it would be highly beneficial, generally under stress or under pressure of PR, whatever it is, you know, generally people succumb to that. So, that whole hot system comes into the play under stress. So, in real life, uh, it may not be easy to delay gratification primarily because when it is required to control yourself, delay yourself uh, and if situation is very stressful and under pressure, hot system can play into the play, come into the play and that may make it more difficult to kind of delay the gratification. Furthermore, chronic stress during childhood hinders this development of the ability. So, some negative events in childhood can hinder this ability to delay like chronic stress if a ch child has experienced chronic stress again and again in the childhood, developmentally they may, may not be able to delay gratification in the adult also. So, impact of childhood experiences can be there in the adults also. Uh, some psychologist says instead of viewing del delay of gratification as a skill, uh, psychologists like Block and Funder and their colleagues uh, propose that it is more of a person's level of ego control which refers to their overall tendency to restrain impulses. It is not a very specific skill, but it is more of a person's ability to restrain their impulses, which can sometimes become uh, better under certain circumstances and can become low under certain circumstances. So, it is one ability to control and uh, overall tendency to restrain impulses. So, on the one, one end of the spectrum, there are individuals who lack control. So, some individuals, they, they do not have any sense of control in terms of delay of gratification. They are highly impulsive individual. Whatever comes, they just do it. Very impulsive without considering the consequence. What will be the consequence of my action? You know, they do not think. So, very impulsive people. So, they lack self-control, delay of gratification. On the other hand, there are individuals who are too much of self-control, excessive restraining themselves when it is not necessarily. So, people can be opposite spectrum also. Too much of control some people and some people have, they do not have any control. Both may be maladaptive in some sense because uh, both may have their own problems. In both extreme, under control or over control are considered maladaptive. Under control individuals struggle to pursue long term goals. If people do not have any sense of control, they cannot do or perform or bring or work or pursue some long term goals because they cannot stick there. To stick to a long term goal, one has to have some self sense of self control and no ability to not distracted by so many things. That will not be possible for impulsive people and lead a fulfilling career and work and so on. Over control individuals on the other hand will miss out on opportunities for pleasures and expressing emotions. Too much of control that can become also maladaptive and the people will not be able to enjoy their life at all. So, that may also be maladaptive if it is unnecessary and too much. So, a science of balance is required, delay of gratification control is very important, but you know to the extent that it is necessary for bringing about productivity on in one's life. Now, can we improve our ability to of ability of delay of gratification? Because this something as research shows that it it it, it is associated with many positive benefits, particularly the success in life and reaching goals and so on. 
Mischel uh, conducted further experiments and discovered that employing various distraction techniques aided children in effectively postponing gratification. Uh, in their experiment, these children, whoever were used, they used many strategies, those who could delay like singing songs, diverting their thoughts, even covering their eyes and so on. These are four children. In their experiment, they found they used all these strategies to delay their gratification. This delaying gratification is not very straightforward in real life situation could be very complex. It is not so easy like those simple experimental setting. Unlike the children in Michel study who were promised secondary rewards after waiting for a short period, every day scenario is not always granted such outcomes. The problem is that in real life, even if you delay gratification, your, you will get a better reward in the future is not granted because there is nothing granted in life, possibility may be higher, but in experiment it is granted that you will get a better reward, but in real life the better reward for which you are kind of delaying gratification may not come at all, that is also possible. So, for instance, if you resist indulging a burger, some fast food, it does not necessarily guarantee weight loss, because if you are in a weight loss program, so if you do not eat a burger, it will not guarantee that there will be weight loss. So, if you choose uh, to skip a social event to study, there is still chance of performing poorly in the exam. So, those better and the uh, long term results may be very uncertain in the real life. So, that creates problem in terms of delay of gratification. People do not see very concrete result, if I do this, whether the better result, result will come or not come, that is not guaranteed. So, it is the uncertainty surrounding this decision that make people immediate rewards so challenging. So, so, it's big, so that creates lot of challenges in terms of delay of gratification. People think something is there, at least it is granted. I can take that or enjoy that. But if I resist that and wait for some time, the future is not certain. So, that creates lot of challenge in the delay of gratification in real life. With the detectable treat uh, right in front of you is a definite pleasure. People at least will have this is definitely there future we do not know. Achieving your long term goal or losing weight appears a distant and uncertain thing. So, this unpredictability of real life circumstances is what adds to the difficulty of delay of gratification. Uh, the time of uh, the timing of the event in the real world is often uncertain and not easily predictable. So, that is why people many times succumb to the immediate uh, reward and whatever pleasures. So, whether one Willingness to what extent one can wait and delay their gratification can be influenced by so many things like what are the world views that person has, how much faith this person have in his or her abilities to bring about the desired outcome, whatever outcome for which the person is delaying the gratification, how much faith he has in his or her ability to bring about that. So, if a, if a student is studying very hard and if he has faith in himself that he will have a very good result, he can bring out that result, then obviously, he, he or she can delay the gratification. So, the faith in oneself is very important. Another important thing is trusting that your goals will eventually be realized. Your trust that goal will come is very important. If you have these factors, the delay of gratification in the real life will be much more or ability in terms of self-regulation will be much better as compared to if you do not have this. So, your faith in your ability to bring about those reward for which you are sacrificing something and your trust that the goal will be reached, that is very important. If you have this, obviously, you will you can sacrifice the smaller things in now to achieve that. So, in a more recent version, Mischel, Mischel's well-known experiment, Kidd and colleagues also in 2003 uh, dealt deeper on this concept of trust. If trust, how can it influences the whole delay of gratification? The experiment followed a similar structure of other earlier uh, experimental setting. But in half of the cases, the researcher deliberately broke their promise of providing a second treat instead of offered only an apology. So, in this case, they just changed the structure of the experiment. In half of the cases, when they promise that if you wait for some time to the children, uh, that you will get a more reward or better reward. So, in half of the cases, they actually did not fulfill that promise. So, broke the trust and they just apologized that, okay, so, sorry, we, could, we cannot give you. So, for half of the cases only and half of the cases they fulfilled as per the promise. So, basically they broke the trust in half of the participant and for half of the participant they did not broke the trust and they see they try to see how it impacted their delay of gratification. 
during the subsequent run of the experiment, majority of the children who had received a promise treat, whoever has received whatever as per their promise given by the experiment, uh, in the initial experiment, once again exhibited the ability to do So, when their promise was, they were asked that they will get a better reward and they were given, then they showed delay of gratification again in the, uh, in, in the uh, subsequent experiment. However, the children who had been de deceived during the first round of the uh, experiment that they were asked that they will be given more uh, better reward, but actually they were not given and they said sorry we cannot give you. So, their trust was broken. For these children, they immediately consumed whatever marshmallow was given as soon as the researcher left the room without waiting for a better reward later because their trust was broken. So, they preferred to have whatever is there rather than waiting for a better reward because the trust was not there that they will get the result or not. So, this shows trust plays very important role in terms of delay of gratification. Furthermore, providing feedback regarding uh, the anticipated wait time, if, if you know very clearly how much you need to wait to get a result, if you have that feedback from wh whatever sources, then delay of gratification also becomes much more easier rather than if you do not know when the result will come and all these uncertainties creates problem in the delay of gratification. Another concept which is connected to self-regulation that we will be talking about is called as self-distancing. <clears throat> so, we will be talking little bit about because it is connected to the self-management and self-regulation. Because some of the aspects of self-regulation we have already discussed here we will be talki talking some other dimensions of it particularly uh, some newer dimensions. So, one aspect of delay of gratification we have talked about which is kind of an aspect of self-control. Another aspect which is important for self-regulation as well as emotional intelligence which could be connected to that is self-distancing for self-regulation. Now, there is a self-reflection paradox. We have already seen that self-awareness when we discussed in the last lecture that introspection could be very, very kind of you know. Uh, the result could differ based on how you ask questions. Sometimes introspection could be successful, may not be successful. So, there is a sense of paradox in that. So, we will see some other reasons why sometimes introspection could be successful and may not be successful in some other context. So, there is a paradox in self-reflection when we reflect on whatever has happened to us. One hand, there is a numerous studies that suggest encouraging individuals to contemplate the reason behind their distress have a significant benefit. So, if you are having distress and kind of self reflect on it, try to understand it, then uh, it gives a lot of benefits in terms of mental and physical well being. So, self reflection many research shows is very good for mental and uh, physical well being, particularly when we self reflect on the distress and the negative, if we are experiencing some negative emotions and thought processes. Assumption is that you know. Uh, most of this research assumption is that uh, rationalize their emotions, people can develop explanations for the negative experience leading closures and emotional belief, closures and emotional relief. So, when you process it properly, so it will reduce the emotion, you will understand what is happening, you will be able to mo get more conscious about your emotional things. So, that is why self reflection can be beneficial. However, some research also shows another body of research that uh, people's attempt to understand the feelings often sometimes can backfire also and trapping them into repetitive thoughts and words and their emotional state. So, sometimes when you are in the negative state of mind and you self reflect it can further increase whole negativity and other things. So, some research shows that is also possible. So, there is a sense of paradox sometimes it is some research shows it is successful, some research shows it may backfire. So, it raises a question why sometimes it is successful and why sometimes it fails. So, to understand this we can use this concept of self distancing as a concept which can give you some ins give us some insight in this direction. So, what is self distancing? So, self distancing is a psychological concept that involve adopting a perspective that is detached and removed from one's immediate subjective experience. So, you kind of create a distance from yourself, you remove yourself from the experiences and look at it from a distance. So, you create a distance from the self that you are. So, that is called self distancing, do not get emerged, you know submerged in it, look from a distance what is happening. So, that is self distancing. So, it is a kind of cognitive strategy that allows individuals to create psychological distance between themselves and their thoughts, emotion and experiences. So, whatever is happening in your thoughts, emotion you just observe 
and look at it from a distance rather than get engrossed in it and whatever happens emotionally you become that rather than you create a distance so that's self distancing it enables individuals to view their thoughts emotions from a more objective external point so as the moment you create a self distance you can objectively look at it understand what is going on when you become too much immersed in it then you are not able to objectively look at it so that's the difference so in self distancing individuals shift their focus away from the intensity of the emotions so they kind of create a distance between the emotions thoughts and themselves and observe the thoughts and feeling as if they are an outsider as if some outsider is looking at them so this perspective shift has shift helps individual gain a broader and balanced understanding of their emotions and experiences which improve self regulation and coping strategies and self control and self regulation everything comes because of this distancing perspective so the background is that you know uh, psychologists have always recognized the advantage of creating a psychological distance for self regulation so distancing always a lot of research has indirectly or directly shown that creating a distance always help us to regulate our emotions um one of the influential study by michel on delay of gratification in children demonstrated that cognitive strategies promoting psychological distance improves children's ability to delay gratification uh, this finding led michel to describe psychological distance as a fundamental factor in enabling self control so it is one of the important mechanisms for self control and self regulation in different aspects even researcher in the line of uh, coping and stress by lazarus and other uh, colleagues also highlighted the benefit of adopting a distance perspective in enhancing emotion regulation cognitive therapists like beck also found that you know distancing is a vital prerequisite for patient to derive benefits from cognitive therapy so some sense of distancing has always been found as a mechanism for self regulation and self control in various you know uh, theoretical perspectives and uh, we have also also discussed mindfulness in one whole lecture and uh, there also you find the whole how the one of the main mechanism why mindfulness is such a uh, beneficial practice in terms of uh, bringing about many positive changes in terms of mental health physical health is because it creates a kind of distancing self distancing which is called as a decentering in the literature of mindfulness uh it's a concept that share conceptual similarity with the self distancing and is considered one of the key elements contributing to the benefit of all the mindfulness so observing thoughts from a more detached perspective and uh, emotions and thoughts uh, is kind of one of the main aspects of the mindfulness and basically you create consciously a self distancing in the practice of mindfulness and that brings about all the positive changes so there there could be two perspective one is self distance perspective and the opposite is self immersed perspective so self immersed perspective will be just opposite to self distancing here self that reflects is same as the self that experiences the emotion so you are experiencing an emotion so there is no distance you are experiencing the emotion you are that emotion you know so there is no distance so self becomes immersed in that experience so experience and self is same thing so that is called self immersed perspective it refers to being fully absorbed since one subjective experiences it involves being closely identified with the immersed thoughts so whatever thoughts emotion sensation is there you closely get identified with it so there is no distance so you become one with the experience so there is no self separate from the experience in this perspective individuals are deeply engaged and personally invested in the experience often experiencing them as they are happening directly to them so whatever is happening positive negative they experience it is just happening to them so there is no distance so that's self immersed perspective one uh, uh, example could be you know suppose you receive a rejection email after applying for a job you got a rejection if you are very self immersed in that moment you will feel devastated and repeatedly ask yourself why did they reject me what's wrong with me why when you are fully immersed in your negative emotions and personalized rejection that can lead to self doubt prolonged distress and so on so you are completely the negative emotion that arouses you are completely one with it so that self immersed perspective self distance perspective individuals will have sense of objectivity they can view their thoughts and emotions more objectively without getting overwhelmed by the 
too much of ident or identified with the emotions. There could be many ways to distance oneself. Uh, so, what, whatever way you create a psychological distance enables individuals to evaluate experiences more rationally, make better decisions and regulate their emotions in a better way. So, in this earlier example, if you take a self distance perspective in a rejection of a job, uh, you would be shifting uh, your focus away from the personalized rejection and adopting more objective view. You may say why rather than saying why I was rejected, you may say for, the, for example, one of the strategy could be you just say your name, why John is upset. So, kind of the moment you say not me, but you take your name as if some somebody else. So, some distance is created and you are able to objectively see what is happening. So, here the self that is focusing on the rejection is psychologically removed from the self that is experiencing. So, self is removed from the experience and objectively it is seen. So, there are different strategies, we will just little bit talk about it. So, what could be the implications of embracing this self distance perspective as compared to self image perspective? Uh, so, there could be many possible uh, benefits. According to Cross and Iduk, uh, self image perspective would definitely would likely le uh, lead individuals to focus narrowly on recounting the specific details of their experiences and uh, like what happened, why did I feel without considering the broader context. So, broadness and broader context one cannot see in the self image perspective. In contrast, self distance perspective would enable individuals to shift their focus to the bigger picture because they are looking objectively and uh, reduce their uh, kind of allowing them to reinterpret the situation in, in a way that could reduce the distress. So, this uh, leads to more adaptive self reflection and self immersion. So, this self reflection whole this paradigm why this paradox was happening because if people are able to do self reflection in a self distance perspective it will lead to reduce distress, but if they are in a self immersed perspective it will lead to more distress. So, why that, that could explain why there are different research findings in this context. So, this is the conceptual framework if you see across an IDUC how it uh, no, self distance perspective bring out positive changes and this bring out negative changes. So, in the self immersed perspective more recounting happens. So, same thing you will be thinking why this is happening, why it is happening to me same recounting is it will increase and reconstruct thinking more productive way and look at the newer perspective, those things will decrease in the self immersed perspective and it may lead to escalating negative effects short term, enhanced physiological stress, lack of meaningful changes in the short term way all these things will happen. In the long term it will lead to greater emotional reactivity, greater vulnerability to uh, recurring thoughts and characteristics of ruminations and all these things will happen in the long term in the case of self immersed perspective. In the case of self distance perspective, recounting will decrease. So, you will not dwell more on why this happening and all this what is that that is possible in the re, uh, recount uh, re self image perspective and reconstruct will increase here. So, you will be able to reconstruct the whole experience and see the broader picture that may lead to short term outcomes like negative effect will reduce, reduce physiological stress, more meaningful change, long term reduce neg uh, emotional reactivity. Uh, reduce vulnerability to recurrent thoughts and remuneration, remuneration everything will reduce. So, this is the conceptual framework uh, which can explain these differences between uh, the outcomes in self immersed perspective and self distance perspective. So, basically in this slide we basically talked about explain this whole thing. So, in the long term there could be many uh, uh, both short term as well as long term that we have already explained. Uh, so, basically research found that even uh, in case of uh, when the participant are asked to revisit their negative experience even week later, those who utilize self distance reported experiencing less distance, less distress even after a week. So, there could be long term benefit of self distance perspective. So, how do you do self distancing? So, there are uh, three major strategies, one is visual imagery, another is linguistic using linguistics and third is Mendel time travel. So, let us very briefly see how these three could work. So, in visual imagery basically uh, you can use this concept to self for self distancing. It involves mentally visualizing oneself and the situation from an external observer standpoint. This techniques allows individual to see themselves and their experiences as if they are observing it from a distance. So, you kind of 
visualize yourself from a distance and see whatever is happening within you as if it is happening to someone else. So, that is visual imagery. For example, a person may imagine watching a movie of their own life. So, you can just close your eyes and see as if you are looking at a movie, whatever is happening in your life. So, there is it will create a distance and uh, observing the events and emotion from a detached perspective. So, this could be one possibility of self distancing using visual imagery. This technique is mostly helpful for past and possible future experiences. Mostly when something has happened, if it is bothering, you can use this and some future apprehension also people can use visual imagery. In this context, generally visual imagery can be helpful. So, you visualize yourself or your life as if some movie is going on and you are observing as a kind of someone else observing the movies and so on like that. So, basically you are creating consciously some distance. Linguistics is another possibility where you create use some word like involves using specific language and pronouns to create psychological distance. Instead of using first person pronouns like uh, I am distressed or why it is happening to me. So, this is becoming like identifying becoming one with the experience rather than a using some different word uh, third person pronouns of their own name reflecting their experiences. So, it that can create distances. For instance, instead of saying I feel upset, a person can say John feel upset or he feels upset. So, you can name yourself and say John feels upset or feeling upset. So, as if by using language you are creating a trick in terms of creating a distance. So, when you say John is feeling upset as if John is someone else and you are looking at it. So, using some linguistics you can also rather than becoming using it first word because the language impacts your mind thought processes. So, the moment you say John feel upset as if John is someone else you are creating a distance from yourself. So, that by that you become more objective and can see things from a detached perspective. So, linguistic shift helps individuals separate themselves from the immediate emotions and it helps them to gain broader perspective and may lead to adaptive outcomes. Uh, so, utilization of one's name and non first person pronouns during in introspection can serve as a self distressing techniques. So, by employing this language element to refer to oneself, it is anticipated that individual would adopt to more objective perspective as if it is someone else happening to someone else and you have privileged access to their thoughts as if you are looking at someone else inner life, you have access to their thoughts and emotions. So, this can be very helpful when you are in the midst of experiences where visualization may not be easy. So, when something is happening now, then visualization and closing eyes may not work. This linguistic trick can work when you are in the midst of experience. The last one is the mental time travel. It basically talks about ability to mentally transport oneself to into the past or future. By mentally distancing oneself from the present moment, individual can reflect their experiences from a temporal distance. So, in the visual imagery, you are just in the present uh, creating a distance and uh, the kinds of visualizing yourself and looking at yourself from a distance perspective. In the mental time table, you are moving ahead or back, transporting yourself in time and look at your life. For example, when analyzing negative experiences, a person can imagine themselves in the future. So, let us say something negative has happened now. You imagine yourself, let us say one week later or one month later how you will look at this incident that is happening now or whatever negative experiences that you are going through. Look at it from let us say after one month how what will happen to this thing. Will it remain the same or something will change. So, from a distance you create a mental time travel and see it from a future perspective. Then generally what happens it is our life experience that with the passage of time things heals down. Whatever we are so much concerned now after one week it may not even you remember it, but now everything is consuming you, but after one week you completely forget about it. So, if you look at things whatever is happening now, especially the negative things from a uh, mental time table from a future, let us say after one week, one month or one year whatever it is, you see what will happen to this, you will find you know you will not have any consequence. So, in that sense it will create a distance and one will be able to gain wisdom and understanding gain from the passage of time. which takes time, but immediately you can create that uh, understanding by mentally traveling to future. So, your focus is on future self as the passage of time improves the way we feel and ne uh, about negative experiences. So, this temporal distance can be done 
uh, by asking people uh, to think about how they might feel about a current stressor either one week from now near future or maybe 10 years or it whatever it, far distance one year one week after or one maybe after one year or something whatever works for one person one can create that mental time travel and then find obviously it, it will not have any significance after one week or after one year whatever it is so the passage of time things kind of heals everything so it will give you some distance to understand the problems of the present and you will not be immersed in it rather than uh, you will understand the bro, uh, no, kind of broader perspective of the situation. So, Cross and Adiyuk uh, propose that mental time table helps self regulation because of impermanence focus. Everything changes, nothing remains. Whatever we are now concerned and kind of consumed by something in the present moment, it will not have any meaning after one week or after one month. So, everything is impermanent. So, that focus becomes that impermanence, impermanence comes into the focus and we understand and it so impact of the present situation reduces. So, thinking about how uh, uh, our future selves will feel about our current uh, troubles can help us recover from emotionally faster by making us more aware that our thoughts and feelings about stressors will fade as the time goes on. So, research evidence also indicate that impermanence focus most likely is most likely the mechanisms behind success of mental time travel. So, time travel, uh, mental time travel can work. One of the reason is that if this whole impermanence focus kind of uh, uh, is successfully you know uh, creates an impact in terms of distancing oneself and reducing the impact of the event itself. So, these are some of the things about uh, self-regulation and some of the specific uh, techniques and details we have discussed. So, with this I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.